establishment of traditional land. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Mandate, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across the federal land. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So um, it's my great honor today here to welcome Minister Osrey Tong uh, on behalf of the Asian Institute and the Mount School of Global Affairs and Public Policies. Our names get getting longer. <laughs> but not like your career is We get accumulating a long list. Um, and for those of you uh, who really follow Minister Tong's career, I think, you know, after a very little uh, introduction, she, uh, she uh, yeah, sorry, uh, she has been uh, <coughs> um, a programmer, of course, um, um, in, in a different universe from our university, a faculty and student here, that she really well known for uh, her roles in uh, revitalizing some of the computer languages as a programmer, and she, she has also been a consultant for Apple and many other uh, major cooperations. And in the public sector in today's, uh, she is also um, served in the Taiwan's National Development Council's Open Data Committees and the K-12 Colloquium Committees, as well as the country's first e-rulemaking projects. Um, but she is, of course, for many of us, also known as her political activism, particularly the Sunflower Movement a few years ago, uh, in which she's actively uh, involved in it. In fact, that she described herself as a conservative anarchist, right? And in many ways, it was because that uh, participation that she was invited to join the, uh, the, the, the Taiwan government, become the first digital minister. And she's also known for the uh, the only minister without a portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, so she's, in other words, she's carrying many hats and she's very busy. So it's really difficult for us to really get her here for a really brief two hour conversations. And we are really grateful that you're here today. And I want to also acknowledge uh, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office for their helps in organizing to make it possible for us to steal her <coughs> tongue for just a couple of hours. And um, I can't sort of emphasize enough how important it is to think about the convergence of things that Minister Tong is involved in, the digital world, computer programming, uh, public sectors, as well as private consulting. Because uh, as we know, for instance, today is the midterm election in the US, right? Um, some decades ago, uh, perhaps you still remember, feel like a long time ago, but it's not that long, that we thought, you know, digital technology is the future. In fact, it has become the future and become now, right? And it's full of opportunities and possibilities about democracy, about transparency, about openness. And then, you know, what happened in the past few years, and then we suddenly, you know, look at it and, you know, feel very depressed, right? with the uh, times when we talk about fake news and the post-truth society, many of us are lose faith in digital technology, thinking of what the future might be if this direction you know, continue the way it is. And at the same time, there's no way we can stop this train that we are, in fact, moving to this direction, right? So, so in many ways, we kind of felt, you know, maybe the talk today, uh, Minister's intervention, the field that you've been working on, uh, perhaps provide us some with some hopes to re revitalize right, our optimism about digital technology, about the digital future. Um, but, so, but without further ado, I would like Minister Tom to, uh, to begin her presentation. And then after that, we will uh, open the floor for uh, Q&A. Again, uh, those who would like to participate through the apps, uh, you should uh, use your app to, uh, to do that. And then at the same time, you could also just raise your hand during the Q&A. Uh, we will also respond to those requests. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Really, really an honor to be here. And um, I see that there's already six questions. And the first one being, good morning. And so good morning, everyone. Very, very happy to be here. 
Uh, we will be on the record, uh, but the video is only taking me in this way, but the audio will be on the record. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, you can either use the Slido app, as we have already seen, or you can write down something, and our staff uh, will be happy to put your <coughs> question on the online system, or you can just raise your hand and start talking in any language that our moderator is capable of translating to English. <laughs> so that's our, our main structure. Uh, and so um, from now until noon, I'll just be responding to your questions. But first, some uh, general introductions about my, uh, my own work. And this actually um, directly ties to the top question in a moment, which is how do I deal with those people who want to hold information and power for themselves. And so um, without further ado, I will just launch <laughs> into this, um, this slide about social innovation <coughs> and how under President Tsai's uh, new idea about uh, many plural values of Taiwan, which she said two years ago in her inauguration speech, saying that before, when we think of democracy, we think of it as a fight, a clash between opposing values, but now, in Taiwan, democracy must be reinvented as a conversation of, among many different values. And that is, uh, I think, the values of Taiwan. So the acting word here is the plural part of Taiwan. And so that will be uh, my opening remark. Um, and this uh, is why I'm kind of um, very optimistic about digital and democracy, which is, I'm, I understand, uh, perhaps rare um, in today's world in people working on digital democracy, so unlike many people today. And this optimism began when I was 15 years old. That was 1996, uh, and I told my teachers and my principal, I was first year in a junior high school, um, that I discovered this new thing called the World Wide Web, and the future of human knowledge is being created there. I write to professors who just write back to me on their preprints, doing research. They don't know I'm only 14 years old, so I'm doing research uh, at the time. And I said to my teachers, I can either be reading textbooks that are 10 years out of date, or I can join participating, creating knowledge that will be in the textbook 10 years afterwards. And surprising, all my teachers agreed with it so much. They faked my attendance records, and I get to quit <laughs> high school and, <laughs> and start a few startups. Uh, so um, my optimism in the flexibility of bureaucracy is really strong from that point onward. And then I discovered this fabulous uh, idea called the, the Internet Society. Um, and it's the organization that still runs the Internet today. Uh, it's been running the Internet for the past few decades now. The Internet Society, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the ICANN, and the other uh, organizations that runs the Internet runs on the idea of radical transparency, meaning that everything we do is public for everybody to see. It runs the idea of voluntary association in the sense that anyone who wants to participate in the development of the Internet, you don't have to apply for a membership, you can just join. It runs into the idea of location independence meaning that the Internet Society doesn't respond or report to any sovereign state. It doesn't even report to the UN ITU. It is by itself, Internet is sovereign. And so I'm taking that idea of Internet governance or collaborative governance into Taiwan's politics in the past couple of years. And the idea, very simply put, is to transform Taiwan from a you know, clash between ideologies into a plurality of voices, exactly as internet had done uh, to the world 40 years ago. And so um, this is through this idea called civic technology. Civic meaning that it enables the society to work together better, and technology meaning that we make it simpler for things to happen. And so for the past couple years, Taiwan has been consistently ranked the top country uh, worldwide uh, for internet participation, for broadband as a human right, for open data, for things like that. And all of this was because at the end of 2014, the uh, premier at the time declared that open government, crowdsourcing, collective intelligence is just going to be the national direction onward. So it's almost a U-turn, and we've been uh, working on that direction for four years now. But why was that? Because four years ago, there was a public demonstration. We occupied the parliament for 22 days. 
Uh, and this is in direct uh, answer to the question about what about people who hoard the information, who hoard the power. At a time in 2014, the MPs were on strike. They refused to deliberate substantially the cross strait Service and Trade Agreement, or CSSTA, because of some weird constitutional loophole that I will not go into. And so they refused to deliberate substantially that agreement, and that creates a window of legitimacy. So the students just occupied the parliament and did the work of the MPs for them. So this is a demonstration in the sense of a demo a demo of a better way to talk about a service and trade agreement that involves half a million people on the street and many more online. And so it's called the Sunflower Movement. And around the occupied parliament, there's more than 20 NGOs, many of them that goes back to decades of working on human rights, on labor rights, on environmentalism, on things like that. And each NGO deliberates the CSSTA from one different angle. And the people who go to the occupied site just cross-pollinate the ideas. And our work as the G0V or Gov0 community is to be a neutral facilitator that enables everyone who talks about everything to be broadcasted online, to be have a live transcript online, to be translated online, to make sure that in any of the NGO booths, everybody can see at the end of the day what other NGOs have deliberated and how the consensus is made around that day. And so every day we check the points that people have general broad rough consensus and every day we begin with a list of the unresolved issues of the previous day read aloud by the students in the occupied parliament and so this process over 22 days is very much unlike other occupies which diverge over time into a you know agenda of everything and nothing uh, and in this case in the sunflower movement the agenda just coalesced converged over the three weeks and at the end of it, there's five very firm commitments and general consensus of everybody who participated that then the head of the parliament took and then agreed. And so the Occupy was a success and it demonstrated to the entire country that it is possible to get consensus even from very divisive topics, from very diverse uh, groups. And so what is Gov0, the uh, civic tech people who provide this uh, communication and digital facilitation methodologies? Gov0 uh, was started in 2012. I joined in 2013. And it is a very simple idea. All the government services in Taiwan ends in gov.tw. I'm sure it's the same around the world. That gov does something, right? Uh, and then for any government service like the legislative, the environmental agency, the national budget, you, you name it, anything. The civil society participating in the Gap Zero movement just built a shadow website <coughs> that correspond to our reimagination of the government services. And so just by changing the um, website address from an O to a zero, you get into the shadow government that provides the same information in a more interactive, more fun, more interesting way. For example, the inaugural project of uh, Gov0 was budget Gov0 TW that shows the national budget that used to be hundreds of pages of PDF files in a way that is interactive, fun, understandable, and you can drill down to exactly the part of the budget that you care about and start a real-time conversation around that particular budget and the spending and procurement around <coughs> it. And all the Gov0 projects, we relinquish our copyright. And so because of that, in the next procurement cycle, municipalities and the national government can just take the shadow website and make it the official website without paying for license or trademark or patents or anything like that. So it is in uh, computer science language, we fork the government. Fork meaning that we take something that's already there, go into one direction, take it into another direction with the hope of it actually changing to the direction that we're taking it, that we merge back to the government. So today, in the government website, join.gov.tw, you can see all their 1,300 ministries projects, all their KPI spending procurements, and anything that you make a public comment will be met with real-time response from Korea Public Service without having to go through MPs and so on. And so 
the civic tech people around that time um, really had a fun time uh, working with half a million people on the street. But most importantly, uh, around end of 2014, there was a mayoral election, the midterm uh, mayoral election. And the mayoral election, very interestingly, all the mayors who did not support the Occupy lost the election. And all the mayors that did participate or su uh, support the Occupy won the election. Some of them didn't even prepare their inauguration speech. Uh, so <laughs> they surprisingly found themselves in the good mayors. And so from that point onward, everybody has to say, you know, open government, collective intelligence, because otherwise they don't get to be mayors. Uh, so it creates a massive change in Taiwan's political culture. And I, I think um, the reason why that there's so many people working in civic tech is really we are the first generation, I'm 37 now, we are the first generation that can do democracy for real. I still remember the martial law. Uh, the people younger than me don't remember the martial law anymore. Um, so when the freedom of the press was first um, given, uh, I think 1987 or something like that, that's the same year as personal computers. So for us, you know, internet, democracy, computers, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, they happen in the same year. They are the same thing. It's the same generation. And so the younger generation, they see democracy and internet as deeply intertwined. And that is also why there's so many people working in the Taiwanese free software community. And when we see free in free software, we always think freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, because we know freedom doesn't come uh, for free. Our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation worked very hard uh, to give the freedom. And we need to use the freedom to keep Taiwan free. And so uh, around that uh, time, all us uh, civic tech people were invited then to the national government and municipal governments as mentors, advisors, understudy ministers uh, to advise the public service on the art of communicating with people and collective intelligence since it's the national direction now, right? So in 2015, we started working on many different cases. I'll just share one with you. Uh, this one was called um, Sharing Economy. And around that time, Uber entered Taiwan uh, without uh, professional driver <coughs> license or, or professional rental cars or anything, just people, amateur um, drivers <laughs> charging each other and, and so on. And it is actually a global thing, right? They started operation over the world. All the red ones are the ones that are in dispute. And so this is like a, a virus of the mind, a meme. Uh, and the meme is something like this. It says that programming code dispatch cars more efficiently than regulations and laws. So we just need to follow algorithm code instead of following laws. It's OK to break the law because the law is too slow and code moves faster. That was the kind of uh, sharing economy meme back in 2015. Uh, and so we, uh, everybody faced a problem uh, around this meme uh, in many jurisdictions. They maybe shut down their local office operation and so on. It doesn't work because the app still lives on and uh, it spreads from passengers to driver to passengers. And so in Taiwan, we're in an exception. The taxi uh, drivers union surrounded the Ministry of Transport, demanding negotiation. But how do you negotiate with the virus of the mind? How do you negotiate with the flu? It's not even in the same category. Uh, and so our only way, we think, is to inoculate people by having people deeply listen to one another, to deeply listen to one another's thoughts, feelings around the same thing. Because we know for sure, because of our work in the Occupy, when people heard from 20 different NGOs, from 20 different sites, they form a holistic picture in their mind. And that is a inoculation against divisive messages. And so we thought, Maybe we can just use the same method, because for half a million people, um, that proved to work. Uber, the stakeholders, just in the thousands, is a small case. And so in that uh, case, we start with this focused conversation method that presents everybody with the facts of the timeline. And most importantly, we allocate it a, um, three weeks also for people to check on each other's feelings, like how people feel about UberX in Taiwan. Only when people resonate with each other's feelings do we move on to ideas, on face-to-face -face consultation. And the best ideas are the ones that take care of the most people's feelings. And finally, we turn that into regulations. 
And this solves an important problem because feelings is a common language that everybody can speak and understand. If we start talking about jargons, about our academic languages, economic, macroeconomic analysis, transportation rules, and things like that, it creates a division of language where people who are specialists speak one language and people on the street speak another language. And in that kind of divided conversation, we create a gap in understanding and then in imagination. And people would just fill in whatever projection they have. So in that situation, ideas grow into ideologies. And once people are hit with ideology, which is a much more potent fires of the mind, people became blind to new evidences. People become blind to each other's feelings. And in that sense, it's very difficult to change people out of ideologies. So it's actually impossible. So what we do is that we change people's feelings. That is more possible. And so based on crowdsourced data from the government, private sector, and the civil society, for the first time, we deployed AI-powered conversation in Taiwan. This AI-powered conversation is very simple to use. We send a link to all the drivers and passengers and so on on their phone using Line, WhatsApp, and so on. They click and they see themselves as a small blue circle, an avatar among the Facebook and Twitter friends that they have. And this resembles uh, the divisiveness or uh, the clusters of people's feeling around the Uber issue. And very simply put, it works like this. You start with a group of people. You start with the people who are your friends. If you don't log in, you start with a lot of famous people on Twitter and Facebook. And then you see yourself here, and then you see one single statement, one single feeling from a fellow citizen that says, maybe I think that liability insurance is important. And that's it. And you can click agree or disagree. And once you do, you move slightly a little bit toward people to feel the same way as you. And the next question appears, uh, next statement appears from your fellow citizen. And then you just click again, agree or disagree. And as you do so, you just move alongside and find your group, your cluster of people. But then this has two effects. The first is that you can see even people who don't feel the same way, they're your friends and family. Maybe you just didn't talk about this over dinner. And the second thing is that and after answering a few yes or no questions, you can share your own sentiment too and ask for people's ideas and call for resonance. What it doesn't have <coughs> is the reply button. Because we discover if you have the reply button, people work on destroying each other's credibility. They post cat pictures or whatever. Uh, and, 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 and it doesn't focus on the statement at hand. So just by taking away the reply button, just as we do on Slido here, um, people, if you see something you don't agree, your best shot is to propose something that you think other people will resonate with, will agree. So it will then automatically mobilize among the networks of private sector, civil society, and the private sector. And always, we find the end result something like this. Now, this is uh, taken from a consultation in Bowling Green uh, by our US uh, friends. But uh, the Uber uh, case is exactly the same. We see people agree to disagree on maybe five divisive ideas. That's the ideological split. But that's it. So people are actually much more interested and more willing to converge on consensus statements that everybody else resonates. And if you just look at mainstream media, or even social media, you will have the flip perception. Like, people are really divided. People, there's lots of ideology. But that is simply not true. That is just that being amplified by the media that want to maximize controversy. If you actually ask people how they feel like and uh, press yes or no on their feelings, always they see that their neighbors feel pretty much the same as they do on many basic matters. And so in that case, like insurance, like safety, like registration, taxation, and things like that, people broadly agreed on, just like during the Sunflower Movement, people broadly agreed on. And then we invite all the stakeholders to show up and live stream the consultation and check with them one by one. Like, this is the will of the people. Do you agree? They, they all say they agree. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, there'll be villains in the story. Uh, and, and since you agree, uh, are there some good ideas that are coherent, consistent, that can make it work? And so which is why Uber is legal in Taiwan now, 
but it's all professional driver's license, professional rental cars. You can even call taxis using the Uber app. It's a full insurance and things like that. And we understand something like that as has been passing the Toronto uh, area as well. But you're also now rerunning a consultation to look at it two years after the ratification. And so this shows a very simple and scalable idea of involving thousands of people in a conversation and reaching a consensus, which is why I was then invited into the cabinet just around the time of this ratification as the digital minister running the public digital innovation space. And when I joined the cabinet, I also run a months-long consultation. You just begin to see a pattern here. A months-long consultation with, um, I think, uh, more than 1,000 subscribers and thousands of inputs. Uh, and I basically ask one question, like what would you like me to work for the public? And what should be my working condition to negotiate with the cabinet? Uh, it's very interesting because after a month of public consultation, the professional journalists, civic tech people, people from all around the world, ask me questions that I only answer publicly. So all my answers just go to those people subscribing to a newsletter who then brainstorm and bring in more interesting ideas. So at the end of it, uh, we collect on three uh, pillars that forms my compact, uh, not contract, uh, to work with the government, not for the government. Uh, and the three pillars is, um, as I mentioned, uh, radical transparency, meaning that everything that I am a chair of even the internal meetings, I publish the full transcript online. And the same holds true for lobbying and journalism interviews. And then it's proven to be very useful. So when like a, a lobbyist, in this case David Bluth, um, speaking for Uber at the time, uh, visits me, it's not only on the record, like directly, immediately, it's on 360 record so that you can put on a virtual reality Google and to relive the negotiation. <laughs> and so they're still lobbying, but this is lobbying for the benefit of everybody so that they can see where he stands, I mean literally, where he stands or sits uh, on, on the matters. And this really enables the public service to be innovative. And because for people who study uh, public administration here, uh, there is a classic um, dilemma for the public service. Because if they work on something innovative and that works, then the minister takes all the credit. And if they work on something innovative and it fails, the public service takes the blame for not executing well, right? Uh, and so it is a, a pretty bad deal for a public service, a career public service, to innovate. So uh, that they don't do much innovation without the right incentive structure. But now, with radical transparency, it's exactly the other way around. Because I published the full context of the why of policy making. So not just the what of policy that is made by the administration. Even in a very early on during the discussion uh, ideation stage, we published the full transcript. So if these things turn out to be good ideas, the public servant who proposed this idea gets full credit because they, everybody sees who was the person who proposed something innovative. And if it doesn't work out, the civil society, the private sector, can carry on our conversation and deliver that maybe as social enterprises or whatever. So the risk is also, also mitigated. And the things go wrong. If the journalist doesn't like it, it creates a controversy. Well, I'm the only minister in the world doing this anyway. So always blame Audrey. So I absorb all the blame. Um, and in that situation, people are very willing to innovate. So, I'm, so, um, so I, I'm, I'd just like to show you a picture of my office before I go into other Slido questions, because I promised that it would just take t uh, 20 minutes. Um, I hope it's working. Yes. So this is uh, my office. This is my office in Taipei, the Social Innovation Lab. Uh, it is uh, a fun place. Uh, and the soccer field here is drawn by people with Down syndrome. Uh, and supported by the Children Are Us Foundation, the Care For Us Foundation, Xihanger, which is one of the oldest and most respected charities from Kaohsiung. Uh, and they just turned those people with Down Syndrome's drawings into decorations all over the place. And this place is co-created by hundreds of social entrepreneurs and innovators. And uh, around that time, we also held a one-month consultation. You see a pattern here. And the consensus uh, is 
first that it needs to be decorated, of course, according to each social entrepreneur's culture, uh, that it needs to open until 11 p.m. every day because it's important for people to mingle. Uh, and it needs to have a kitchen, a cafe, and a resident chef. Uh, and the minister needs to be here every week. So I'm here every week from Wednesday, uh, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Anyone can come and talk to me. It's my office hour, provided that they're willing to be on the record of the conversation. I can talk more about this idea of social innovation in an open, collaborative lab setting. You see all those self-driving tricycles running around and things like that. <laughs> but but, but I, for me, this provides a perfect like sandbox playing ground for people to test new ideas like AI and so on in a harmless way, in a way that people can have first-hand experience without the fear, uncertainty, and doubt about digital technologies. So that's 20 minutes, and let's get back to the questions. So, wow, 15 questions already. Uh, and feel free to raise your hand anytime. I'll see. Um, Audrey, did you mind sharing your viewpoint about cross-strait relationships, Taiwan's international status, and how those can be improved by digital technology for sure? Um, so the t-shirt I'm wearing, um, it has <coughs> 17 colors. And these are the colors of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the SDGs, for people who are not very familiar with it, are a set of consultation results um, published by the UN after the UNDP ran a consultation. Uh, and I think the sunflower is half a million people. The UNDP consulted over one million people, so more people uh, around the world. And after a consultation called A Million Voices, there was a report. Um, they asked people all over the world, what is the world that you would like to see in year 2030? And then they ask people all around the world, and there's like one million different voices, and the people in the UN worked to coalesce these wishes into 169 targets, concrete targets. And those 169 targets has two important properties. First, each one reinforces the other 168. So no matter which of these you work in, it's guaranteed to reinforce the work on everybody else, so it doesn't cancel each other out. And the second thing is, it encompasses sustainable economy, environment, and society as a holistic picture, instead of separating the world into developing and developed countries, or into the private, public, and social sectors, it calls for a cross-sectoral approach to reach those common visions for the world in 2030. And so for us in Taiwan, like in my post as digital minister, when I was uh, visiting New York during the UNGA and talking to uh, my counterparts in other jurisdictions, or when I was in Geneva uh, in uh, the UN IGF, uh, I pr uh, participated as a robot uh, to Internet Governance Forum. I always share my work uh, through the SDGs lens, and we always say Taiwan can help. And by Taiwan can help, we mean specifically that we solve our own social environmental problems through economically sustainable means, like good business to solve <laughs> innovation uh, uh, issues around social and environmental problems. And my work as digital minister is on 1718, meaning that everybody agrees on the same reliable data. 1717, to make sure that it works across sectors, and 176 in that we share the work of our results in a way that is beneficial and not colonizing for every other country. So I'll just use one simple example for two minutes to illustrate this idea of innovation that engage all the different sectors. <coughs> uh, in Taiwan, there is this um, global uh, trend, of course, on IoT, you may have heard of it, the Internet of Things. Uh, that is to say, small devices that can sense the environment and report that what they sensed to the uh, cloud, meaning uh, to a large cluster of machines. Um, and so people in Taiwan really care about air quality. And so without waiting for the government, they just engage themselves using what, what's called air boxes, meaning uh, like really low cost, like less than 100 uh, US dollars devices. Everybody can just put those boxes 
to their balcony, to their schools, to their homes, wearing it and so on. And it just senses the air quality and reports to the clouds. And so um, the Gov Zero people, of course, um, support it with the ICT technology to visualize. So it's not just to measure the air quality of your local home, but actually using your home Wi-Fi or some other technologies, you can upload to this global visualization network that lets people view at a glance of the digital gap in Taiwan, right? <laughs> of where the, the, the Taiwan people has been um, you know, active digitally. Um, but there's many people, uh, of course, in the mountains, in indigenous areas, and things like that. And that is the government's uh, responsibility to support them with accurate air measurements in the places that are blank. But this is very rare, actually, in our region, um, in Pacific Island or in East Asia, because many other ministers tell me they will not wait for the citizen scientists to organize themselves to be 2,000 strong. If it's 100 people, they will you know, get the leader to join the government. If it, they don't join the government and it organize to 1,000 people, maybe they get disappeared. Uh, and the reason why is that this really challenged the legitimacy of the central government. If you have two numbers, one measured by the government and one measured by this participatory network, of course people are going to trust this uh, number that's participated by the citizen, even if those two disagree, and even if this one is more precise, right? And so, because of that, it's seen as a threat to the governmental authority uh, for many um, economies and jurisdictions in our region. Uh, but in Taiwan, uh, we take a different approach. We say, you know, we can't be the civil society, we join the civil society. So what the government does is manufacture low-cost stencils for people to use, to uh, put new spots um, the ones that are indigenous or less digitally inclined, we have problem as human rights, and we listen to the citizen scientists who say they really want to have a air box here in the Taiwan Strait, uh, which is partly an answer to the question about the Taiwan Strait. Um, because people really care about um, the air pollution quality here, because people can then tell whether the air quality is because of domestic causes or whether it's because of air quality from the other side of the Taiwan Strait. But of course, no citizen scientist will be able to support an air box in that point because there's literally nothing there. Uh, even if some of them fly drones, they can't really do you know 24-hour drone operation in that particular uh, place. But the government can because we uh, have wind turbines, uh, power plants that we're setting up in that region. So that we say, you know, we just install those wind power plants, and on the top of each of them, we set up air boxes that transmits the air quality back to the civil society operated network. And so the most important thing here is cross-sectoral collaboration. The many people who are environmentalists here, they don't necessarily trust the government with their numbers. So when we say we're building a national system that aggregates everybody's numbers on meteorology, on air quality, water quality, and so on, some of them say, you guys may be changing our numbers the day before the election. How do we know that we, you will not do that? Uh, and because it's a hot topic in our mayor election. <laughs> uh, and of course, the, the National High Speed Computing Center will never do such a thing. But of course, it is people's right to distrust the government. And it's the government's duty to find ways to trust the people. And so uh, we innovated and find uh, a few people who are very well versed in this new technology called distributed ledger technology, or DLT, commonly known as blockchain. Uh, so the distributed ledger, simply put, is a way for people to add new numbers to a common ledger. Everybody can write to a ledger book, and it appears automatically to everybody else's books. And you cannot ever erase anything on it. You can only add to it, and you cannot change the numbers. And any attempt to change the numbers will be detected by everybody else holding the same distributed ledger. So this is a new technology that's invented by someone that doesn't ha even have an identity, uh, uh, the Bitcoin creator. Uh, that is uh, a hip uh, technology the past few years. So we use DLT, the distributed ledger, to make sure that when the numbers are uploaded to the National Supercomputing Center, it's got a snapshot, it's storing the DLT, and so whenever people can see if that we want to change the numbers, everybody will get notified of it. So we'll never change the numbers. And so that enables a cross-sectoral trust 
And because it's all open source, meaning we relinquish the copyrights, people around the world can just download the code, put it into open hardware like Arduino or Raspberry Pi, and then just start their own airboxes. And if they don't change the code, the code by default uploads to the Taiwan network. Of course, they can choose other networks, but that means that by default, we now have an uh, international network that we can contribute to climate science and things like that. And so for that, we have one single entry point, the website, collectiveintelligence.taiwan.gov.tw, that collectively uh, measures the planet and let the planet speak through uh, wind turbines on the Taiwan Strait and other places. And so uh, this is our position, basically. We solve our local social environmental problems through technology and innovation. It's good business also. And then we export that uh, idea through open innovation to all over the world. And you can find our national strategies on AI just by going to ai.taiwan.gov.tw, <coughs> social innovation just by going to si.taiwan.gov.tw, on smart cities uh, by going to smart.taiwan.gov.tw, and on biomedical industries by going to bio.taiwan.gov.tw. It's all very short, very easy to remember. But the medical industry tells us bio and medical are two things. Uh, uh, absorbing them under bio Taiwan, they, they, they are not so comfortable with it. So that if you type biomed.taiwan.gov.tw, it goes to the same website. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the domain name is free of cost. It doesn't cost anything, right? So whatever you want to call it, it just just call it that. So I hope that answers the question because uh, it is actually improved by digital technologies and the people who are in other jurisdictions that may uh, face social pressure by publishing those numbers has in their ally, Taiwan, and which is why Reporter Without Borders and other international NGOs set up their headquarters in Taiwan because they know if you put your numbers on a distributed ledger and Taiwan receive it, we will never censor your reporting. We will never censor your data. Yes, there's a follow-up question. Um, so I know that there's a lot of dependency on you know, digital technologies and that implies sort of uh, you know, the backbone of the internet and Taiwan being sort of sovereign or something like that. I'm wondering, What's the cybersecurity posture of Taiwan, and um, how does that interact with sort of politics kind of in the region with other powers that sort of, you know, have a vested interest in uh, oh, yeah. projecting cyber power and that sort of thing? Yeah, so our cybersecurity strategy. Um, so just like Estonia, uh, we're on the front line. Uh, and uh, around the year 2000, I personally work on the advocacy and translation of a project called Freenet which is an early version of something like Tor or Shadow Socks and things like that. Um, because the uh, Great Firewall and the Golden Shield was still in its nascent stages. Uh, it was relatively easy to break uh, at that time. Um, but in any case, I personally work on these technologies. I, I believe that secure communication is a human right. Uh, and so because of that, our Snowden moment came um, way before the, the Western world. <laughs> we, we understand how is it like uh, to use the internet technologies for intranet purposes. And we uh, have, uh, when we say freedom, it's not just freedom to, to create, assemble, and things like that, but also negative freedoms. Freedom from surveillance, freedom from coercion, freedom from all those different you know, state control powers. And so this is uh, our real situation. And so when I became the digital minister, um, our internal workspace is powered by this um, software called Sandstorm that I personally contributed to. And so the first act I did as digital minister is to recompile the Linux kernel uh, <laughs> uh, to secure, to harden it against cybersecurity attacks. And um, Sandstorm, very simply put, um, and I can open our Sandstorm <coughs> instance at any time. Uh, Sandstorm, very simply put, is a uh, what we call productivity software suite. Uh, and uh, it has the same um, functionality as Slack, which is a popular um, app for people to communicate, uh, as Dropbox, which is a popular app for people to share some files, uh, to Trello, which is how people manage their work in a uh, structured fashion, uh, to Google Doc and Google Spreadsheet, uh, which is a way for people to uh, do writing and calculating collaboratively. Uh, I personally maintain the spreadsheet part. Uh, and so all these things uh, are essential for the government to function. And all these things are essential for people to trust each other uh, when we share this 
uh, to every other ministry. So any public servant can use this system for free, and they can also write new applications to run on it for free. And this <coughs> calls for what we call a dispense in depth. Uh, at any time, we can see all my colleagues, what they're working on, waiting, doing, done. So this creates a culture, a new culture, of more than 20 ministries working together, each other not afraid of letting every other ministry know what they are up to. And this is, of course, if you work in agile development, this is like common sense for the past 10, day, 10 years. But for the public service, it is something really new. Uh, and so, and this, of course, needs cybersecurity. So we asked our top-notch white hat hackers why it has meaning that they attack the system and then they report the vulnerabilities, the, the uh, loopholes, and file them as CVEs, which is like medals in their profession. Uh, and so in any case, uh, we work with the top white hat hackers in Taiwan who won like the, I think the second place in DEF CON and things like that, consistently the best hackers in the world uh, for half a year. And because this system is open source, it's not just attacking from the outside, they look at it line by line and find vulnerabilities in it and so on. And they concluded after half a year that this is the most secure sandboxed system that they can find at, at the moment, the state of the art. And so we're reasonably sure that anything we develop on it, even a junior public servant who knows a little bit of JavaScript, which is a language that writes web applications, can write an app that lets people order lunch boxes together, which turned out to be one of the more um, popular apps <coughs> in our internal app market. Uh, and we, we also publish them uh, on the wide internet too. So if you run <coughs> a digital service here that wants some way to order lunch boxes together, uh, you can totally um, you know, take our contributions. Uh, we have taken photos of all the restaurants uh, around the T Taiwan Central Administration uh, and uh, basically <laughs> digitizing their menu uh, so that around lunchtime it will it's single sign on it automatically remembers my name my my favorite food uh, and, and, uh, from the last time ordering for this restaurant and then we can just get lunch boxes together um, but it's very useful. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but this app is written by someone who is not a certified cybersecurity author exactly because the app is running on an abstracted sandbox contained layer and the uh, defense in depth the system is there so that anything you put on it will be secure by default. So that is the answer to your question. And also we make sure that for all the major um, government projects, we allocate at least 5% of the total budget in procurement for cybersecurity. So this is the norm. When we do any new project, we ask the white hackers to attack and report before the black hats do. And so it creates an economy for them. They're paid very well. They meet with the president and digital minister every now and then uh, so that they don't go to the dark side, which has cookies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so that's answer to your follow-up question. Um, any question from the audience? Uh, yes? Oh, yeah. You mentioned about Uber. Yes. In Taiwan, the situation yes. is quite a little bit different. We are talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of taxi drivers. Oh, yes. So, if we are not careful about digital technology development yes. in the future, yes. we could have a big impact on people life. Yes. And I hope that the government policies and any any planning for digital technology in the future mm -hmm. should always keep people in mind, number yes. one priority. Yes. Otherwise we will see huge impact and people yes. when ang people are angry they will vote in their way. Yes. Very quick, we will see that on the 25th, on the 24th of November. Yes. How will be the numbers in Taiwan? Yes. So that you know, you're talking about 2030. Yes. Let's keep in mind, in 1933. Yes. Humankind, mankind, most terrible ap apocalypse created by Adolf Hitler. And Adolf mm -hmm. Hitler was both by free democratic yes. election. So, we should not bet on freedom and democracy too much. We have to defend freedom and democracy because it is so weak. And if we cannot make people happy, we will see major change in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, although that's not the question. I how, agree with your how sentiments. How would you resolve the taxi driver problem if, if we are going forward with stronger Uber? 
Right, so Uber is already legal in Taiwan. We ratified that just like here uh, two years ago. Uh, and we see two branches, like if the taxi are already unionized, they already have a app developed by a co-op, they actually partner with Uber. You can now call uh, like the Crown Taxi and other taxis using the Uber app. So they become a, one of the venues that the taxis get a business. And also because of a new regulation, you can now call taxis uh, on 7-Eleven, uh, which is a popular, you know, um, I, I'm not sure what they are anymore, all-purpose store uh, in, in Taiwan, uh, so that you, that you can call a taxi easily, and the taxi uh, fleet that comes to you doesn't have to be painted yellow. Uh, it, it basically opens the door for taxi that operates uh, in the app-based uh, telecommunication way. And the largest fleets like Taiwan Taxi and so on, uh, they all switched to an Uber-like model uh, with their apps and things like that. So they actually enjoy uh, um, higher um, living quality. But it is true that if the taxis are not unionized, if they do not join an app-based fleet at the time, uh, the, their, their uh, work quality or their life quality or their earnings and so on uh, are less than, than before. But that has been a stable trend even before Uber joined, because the Taiwan Taxi and other fleets that use the app for active engagement is able to retain customers over repeated calls. Uh, and so the non-unionized and non-app-enabled taxis, which mostly rely uh, on, the, on the street uh, hailing of taxis, they are kind of dwindling down even before Uber enters the market. And so it is essential, I totally agree, that we need to find a way uh, for those taxi drivers to find useful and um, work with dignity uh, in their line of work. But it is also the same actually for, for example, teachers also. Um, we are rolling out a curriculum reform next September and it calls for teachers to be co-learners with students. They are no longer people who hand out authoritarian standard answers. And so the, they must do critical thinking, media literacy, and so on with the student. And not all teachers are happy with that. There are teachers who uh, are very well versed in the standardized testing East Asian you know, teaching style uh, for decades. And when we ask them to change their teaching style, it is very difficult for them to adapt. And so this is happening in all the different uh, walks of life. Uh, and we are working toward this way in two ways. First, that we're um, asking them not to change their work style, but to be essentially mentors that look at existing workflow and find out which part of it can be automated. So in a sense, they become designers or mentors for newer generation of people who design digital automations. And some of them are willing to do this work. And for those people who are not that willing to do this work and mentor the younger generation, uh, we in, in improve our lifelong education so that they can rejoin not just community college, but starting next year, ordinary co college also on what we call university social responsibility programs. And so the USR programs are also about SDG. So if they care <coughs> about like a renovation or a revitalization of a community, they can join the so-called demand-based transportation service. And so basically become like tour operators and things like that for even future autonomous cars. They can accompany people who are elders, who live in places where public transport are not that good, and basically uh, repurpose their service to that one of long-term care and things like that, to accompany people with handicaps, with accessibility needs, and so on, which is at the moment not very well served by Uber or by the other large uh, app-based taxi fleets. So that is our main strategy. I'm not pretending that uh, this will be an easy migration, but this is what every um, country in the world that is facing with digital technology and AI. So what we're now doing is just to include everyone as possible, but everyone will take different time to adjust. Yeah. Were you ever threatened? Were you ever threatened? To? I don't know about life, because, you know, as you said, all of these sudden changes, there yes. are people there. Yes. They are very angry about it. Yes. So were you personally yes. threatened? Threatened. 
Yeah. It's not like <coughs> it's not like you know assassinating me stops the yeah. digital transformation. <laughs> so. <laughs> So no, 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 I, I wasn't personally threatened. Um, people uh, focus a lot of anger, of course, on me personally, but it's not a personal threat to remove me from the game because it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but we, do, we do have people, um, and I will just use one simple example because it's such an uh, interesting example um, that illustrates um, how we deal with um, the idea that everybody is free to raise e-petitions that makes everybody's um, anger very apparent. Uh, and this is the, um, let me just find this somewhere, somehow. Um, yeah, I think it's this one, yes. So, um, yes, so uh, last May there was, uh, not to me personally, but to the Minister of Finance, uh, there was a, a petition last May. Uh, we have an e-petition <coughs> system where anyone who raised 5,000 e-signatures verified by SMS and email can ask a ministry to come forward and respond to that person. And this person, Zhuo Zhi, uh, says that a tax filing system is explosively hostile to use. Uh, I think that's an accurate translation. Uh, and uh, his uh, petition is full of negative energy that I will spare you the content. <coughs> and, but it went viral. A lot of people just called for the Minister of Finance to resign because their experience using Mac and Linux and iPad to file taxes is really explosively hostile. Um, if you use Safari, which is the default browser on iPad and Mac, to open our tax filing system page last year, it will say, please wait for a few moments for the app to be installed. The Java applet will take some time to start. But because Safari blocks pop-up windows like advertisements, uh, one of our MP, uh, MP Huang Guochang, waited for four hours and nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> Um, along the way, I mean, filing tax is not a happy experience for most people. And if you add things like that along the way, people are just going to explode. And so 80% <laughs> of people on, online who posted on our forum asked the Minister of Finance to resign, or they accused the vendor who make this software of you know collusion or bribery or whatever. And there's many. Uh, it's not quite death threats, but very angry satires and parodies made uh, of the central administration. So not to me personally, but you know something something that. You know, the first yeah. have wanted uh, to divert business towards his business. Yeah, maybe, business. maybe it and could you know, be, it could be. Yeah, your yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, we we don't know, right? Because it's pseudonymous. We don't know this person. Uh, and how we handle it very simply is that in every ministry we have a team of participation officers or POs. This is a new installment as of uh, last, last year. It's a national regulation that says in every ministry, in addition to the media officers that talks to the mainstream journalists and the uh, MP, the parliamentary officers that talk to the MPs, we now have the third kind of people, the participation officer that talks to people that talks to people who raise e-petitions, that talks to people who are on the street, that talks to people who are very angry, uh, maybe at the government, maybe at each other. And so um, the Ministry of Finance PO, Yang Jingheng at the time, um, is very quick to respond. Within 36 hours, he posted a public invitation to all the people who complained, saying, by virtue of your complaining, uh, we cordially invite you two weeks in the future to join our co-design workshop to make a better tax filing experience. And so your entry ticket is your complaint. And after he posted this invitation, and if you don't live in Taipei, feel free to dial in to our YouTube live stream and answer and input your ideas over it with Slido. So it's also not Taipei only. And after he posted this invitation, it's changed the sentiment more than 80% of people start offering useful criticism, start offering what they have to input, and only less than 20% are still saying the minister must resign. And so <laughs> this simple invitation changes things. And so finally we meet this person, 
And so, so he is actually a professional user experience designer. So the one who cares suffers. And so that's his profession. And uh, his profession has been uh, increasing its standards led by Apple uh, for the past 10 years. So what's working pretty well 10 years ago, stays unchanged for 10 years, are now unacceptable by Apple users' standards. Um, and so basically, he contributed to all these ideas, co-creation workshops, by channeling what people have said online on Slido and on our e-petition platform. And for people who uh, learn design thinking, this is called user journey mapping. This is one of the very standard, like basic tool you learn in your first year in design thinking. We divided the experience from before the text filing, during the text filing, after the text filing, and into what the user actions are, what their needs are, what their problems are, and what their emotions are. And the important thing here is that during the co-creation workshop, we work with the trolls and work with the people on the internet in a way that doesn't count the numbers of uh, sentiments. If 5,000 people have the same sentiment, it's just one post-it note. It doesn't matter if you mobilize or not. It measures diversity, not counting of heads or showing of hands. And the other thing that we promise is that, unlike other jurisdictions, we will never harmonize your comments. And so basically, um, if the people on the internet says that the words are just explosively overwhelming, we just post that. If they say, right, it's just <laughs> so over-decorated that I feel confused. Uh, we, we just post that. So we never harmonize people's uh, sentiments. We show them on an overview map and check on each other's feelings. That's our core principle. And we even allow people's sentiment to challenge our own assumptions out of scope challenges. Like last year, when people are filing for the tax, at around the end of it, a mascot from the Ministry of Finance will jump up and down and say thank you for your contribution to the country uh, in an um, attempt to make people feel better. And, <laughs> and uh, someone from the internet uh, pointed out quite um, brilliantly, when I think about filing taxes, I don't feel better at all. So just shorten the experience. Don't even bother one second to make me feel good. It's not possible. So <laughs> which is, I think, one of the most insightful contributions. Anyway. So, <laughs> so we, we reoriented our design based on that and co-created the text filing system. It used to look like that, and now it looks like this. And this year, it's 96% of approval rating, and the other 4% know that their input will be taken into account in the next year's text filing system. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah. Um my name is Gloria Fang. Yes. I'm the president of Canada Hong Kong Link, uh, which is a Canadian community organization yes. uh, supporting the movement in Hong Kong, yes. as well as Taiwan. Yes. And uh, I have a question regarding uh, your, you know, innovative technology. Yes. I've heard I, I, this idea in the survey engagement, you know, perspective. Yes. However, there's always a downside mm -hmm. uh, in technology, mm -hmm. and my question is. Uh, in face of you know the common hacking into technology, right? Either by five cents or ten cents, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in creating the fake public opinion, mm -hmm. or even uh, by direct hacking into mm -hmm. your system, or mm -hmm. maybe uh, by inserting a chip in some of the uh, mm -hmm. social media oh, devices, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. By foreign powers such as CCP mm -hmm. uh, in the you know, joint venture in developing the 5G mm -hmm. technology. Venture, yes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <coughs> okay. uh -huh. So what would be your strategy uh -huh. and tactics yes. in preventing all this mm -hmm. kind of you know, shop power, mm -hmm. manipulation, mm -hmm. infiltration mm -hmm. from happening in Taiwan? Yes. So yes, uh, uh, we had, yes, sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, Go, just ahead. That say Go ahead. How to <coughs> fight for this kind mm -hmm. of situation, mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. in oh, yeah. And how the government, especially national defense, mm -hmm. admit that uh, China tried to intervention or attack Taiwan's election? Right? Well, they did that in uh, every single election yeah, before. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Are you seeing that at least? Uh -huh, and yes. how uh, Taiwanese government yes. using uh, open data yes. government or uh, yes. citizen technology to pro okay. protect 
Taiwanese election or Taiwanese uh -huh. democracy? Yes, that's an excellent question. So you asked about both cybersecurity and um, disinformation. Uh, cybersecurity, I think I've already answered, is an early <coughs> part of the strategy, basically making sure that white, our white hat hackers, they are not trained academically, they are trained in the field, and <laughs> that they are paid very well, and they get recognized, and they have very high social status, and we guarantee 5% uh, for major uh, government projects. 6% for municipal and 7% for small projects that goes to cybersecurity so they have very good living and don't go to the dark side. Uh, I think that is the, the strategy that we have and we have a new cybersecurity act that mandates uh, such personnel in all the critical infrastructures and all the different uh, government and municipal um, um, governments. Uh, and that's, I think, pretty much what Estonia has done. And, and so uh, in the front line, that is what we do. And we've been doing that for a decade or so now. So yeah, we're, we're pretty much there. Um, this information, though, that's another thing altogether. Because it's not attacking the, the fabric of technology. It is attacking the fabric of trust. right? So it's a different thing, uh, like completely different thing. And so um, I gave a talk around this uh, topic in the Taiwan-US Global Cooperation uh, Training um, Forum. Um, just before I fly to Canada. So I'm going to give you a very abridged version of my talk of how we tackle uh, the, the problem. Uh, but first, um, so I use the term misinformation if it's intentional or um, wrong, like evidently objective but wrong, or uh, causes harm, uh, but not at the same time. So for example, satire, parody, is intentional and it's false. But it's not intentional to cause harm, because people know it's parody, right? It's just political commentary. Or for journalistic speculations, right? Uh, maybe they sometimes cause harm, but they are, it's not their intention, because they have partial information, and the government needs to clarify it. But sometimes there are actors that manufacture information that is both intentional and false and intend to cause harm. And when those three pillars, uh, conditions meet, we call them disinformation. And they're no longer misinformation. So in uh, Mandarin, Zheng Yi Xun Xi and Jia Xun Xi, respectively. And we don't use the, the F word, the fake word, uh, to describe news. Um, in Taiwan. This is a presidential level decision. <laughs> in, in her uh, National Day uh, speech, she used the term disinformation, jia xiaoxi, instead of fake news, jia xinwen. And this is the same for the entire administration. We don't use the, the, the words jia xinwen anymore. And the reason why is that, personally, both my parents are journalists. Uh, and um, the term fake news itself, to me, although you can use it to describe this information, it carries a connotation that somehow this has something to do with the journalistic output. And, and this is a um, attack and affront on the status of journalism in the society. But we need journalism for democracy to thrive. And so we will not misassociate the term news with disinformation, which is why we never use now in official communications the term fake news in Taiwan. We just say disinformation, organized disinformation, crime, criminal disinformation, but not fake news. So this is just terminology. <clears throat> and the second thing is that we observe that it is a global phenomenon, that it reduces trust of everybody, not just public sector, but especially among the people with different uh, feelings and thoughts. And that around this region, according to the Civicus Monitor, we are the only jurisdiction that has an expanding civil society space in terms of freedom of assembly, speech, and so on. We're not saying that we're like, New, I don't know, Scandinavian or New Zealand or Australia, but in our region, <laughs> we're the only expanding one, and everybody is shrinking. Uh, and so because of this, maybe in five generations down in the future, the freedom of speech will be seen as an instrumental value as in other jurisdictions. But here in Taiwan now, today, freedom of speech is seen as a core value because I still remember the martial law. Many people still remember the martial law, and nobody wants to go back to the martial law era. So that forces us to find innovations that attack, that fight disinformation specifically 
without harming the, the non-disinformation content that is freedom of speech, that is satire, that is journalistic reporting. And so <clears throat> we basically said, say that if you have a friend that you meet um, every um, Wednesday for dinner, uh, or you go to movies, or you play basketball together. If you hear about gossip about that friend, you would not spread the gossip. You would just say, I'll chat with them the next time we meet. Right? You would just message them and wait for their response. On the other hand, if that friend only meets you every three months and only speaks in legalese, of course you are uh, motivated to spread rumors about that friend because there is no useful fact-checking or clarification around. And so <clears throat> our government commits ourselves whenever we see this information that's spreading before it can reach a critical mass. It's like you know epidemic. Before it reaches the critical mass, within four hours, we are committed to provide with a evidence-based clarification. And so this turns the people's mindset from a real-time strategy or tactical game to a more like turn-based game, like chess or bridge or something. When people hear something that is um, disinformation or rumor uh, in the morning, they know that by noon time, there will be a clarification from the government. When they hear it on the noon news, they know that by evening news, they will get a clarification. So this is our first line of defense. And the second is that if we don't uh, do that, or we don't do that fast enough, of course, there are room for organized, even criminal, disinformation to grow. And then for that, we will have to work with the civil society partners to reveal their attempts in a timely fashion. And so, <clears throat> just very briefly, um, we do two things. First, we partner, again, uh, enhance availability of reliable data, encourage effective partnerships by uh, partnering with educators who, as the part of the new curriculum, as I already mentioned, we teach media literacy critical thinking by asking the teacher to serve not as an authority, but as a way to challenge students to think independently. So this is like, you know, we have some dam that, uh, you know, blocks the flood a little bit, that cleans the water a little bit when it's flooding. But ultimately, we need to teach children to swim. Children need to learn how to tell the set agenda, the framing, the things like that in the information they receive. If the teachers are authoritarian, if we say some printed font in some voice is always standard answer, this information piggybacks on that. It's like a backdoor in people's mind. And, and when it's formatted in that way, people just spread it without even thinking. And if children are taught the art of critical thinking and self-media literacy, then that actually gets mitigated. But for people who are, of course, still susceptible uh, to um, such kind of disinformation, we find most people are on um, uh, encrypted channels. Line, uh, Line is the largest one. It could be WhatsApp, it could be um, Telegram or whatever. So there's a lot of people using only Line on, in, on, on Taiwan. And those people think maybe lying is the internet uh, because they don't have the time or inclination to learn good Google or uh, some other way to check for the facts. So if they receive some disinformation on the lying platform, they are uh, very amenable to just spread it without double checking because there's nowhere else to double check in their internet using experience. So it's very important to bring the fact checking to the lying and to end system. And the line company said that they can't help because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. They don't even know what is being sent in their messaging platform. They only know the stickers that you use, but that's not very useful. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we partnered, again, with the GovZero community. There is a GovZero website for everything. Uh, so um, this is uh, GovZero's contribution. Um, it's called Cofacts. Uh, and uh, just to make sure, that people don't think of zero is misogynic or something. Uh, it, every time you refresh, it's changed to a different relationship. Um, so um, it's not particularly gender biased, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so if you go to the uh, Cofax website, I ask you to add that bot as a line friend. And once you add it to a line friend, there's about 50k, 60k users now. Anytime your family sends you something that you think is perhaps a rumor, you can send forward very simply to that bot. And that bot can get back to you 
uh, and all you, the bot is literally named, is it true or not? Mm -hmm. And this is a very good first reaction to any disinformation campaign. If you just reply to every disinformation, it turns people's mind from a fast thinking uh, reaction to a slower thinking mode where people think, stop and think, uh, yeah, is it true or not, right? And so this part helps to remind people of that, and they just reply very quickly whether this is true or not. But the most important contribution of this bot, aside from the media literacy education for the elderly, is that we see all the trending disinformation campaigns. It used to be, to be hidden, right? If it's end to end encrypted, what we found is that those organized disinformation perpetrators, they test in different channels susceptible to conspiracy theories and test the strains like A-B testing it uh, to find the most viral strain after testing it for a few weeks before then amplifying it on all the other social media channels. This is like the breeding ground for disinformation. And before, we don't have any visibility to this breeding ground. But using an exactly the same approach as we did around 20 years ago, I would, I'm a veteran of the spam war. 20 years ago, people thought email would be broken and that our inbox would be taken over by Nigerian princesses or something like that. Uh, and, and, and our uh, work around that time is the same. We ask people to flag their junk emails to contribute to the public awareness. Uh, we develop tools like Spam Assassin and things like that, and uh, the community organized around what's called Spam House uh, that reviews uh, all the junk mail efforts and to reveal the perpetrators and their patterns of operation. And so you can see which rumors are being tested and trending here in Taiwan. Uh, and as you, you can see, it's now election season, so many of these are political. Uh, but on the other hand, always, actually, um, you always see if you eat something and something together, um, it will do something to your health. Uh, <laughs> this one is still trending, even though it's election season. Uh, because people, I, I, I don't know, they genuinely care about the health of their family or something like that. So, so um, these, are, these are still trending, even though it's midterm election. <laughs> and so, and so um, but, but what's important here is that it gives each rumor a URL, a website address, so that it can be talked out in the open. So you can share it on social media and ridicule on how ridiculous this is. Uh, and you can do the fact finding together. Everybody can join. And also, basically, that it lets people have a complete overview of what kind of campaigns are currently operating in Taiwan. Like around referendum, there's many rumors now spreading around the five referendum concerning marriage equality. And uh, it, we're pretty sure it's not the CCP. It's actually both Taiwanese people <coughs> trying to uh, make people vote one way or another in the referendum. Uh, but then uh, there's a dedicated task force to look at rumors from both sides and then to devise neutral responses that can convince both sides that marriage or the existing civil code or things like that or some uh, you know, physiological facts and things like that are not what the rumors um, are saying. And so this is important because then it makes people aware that there are concerted campaigns doing their work. And finally, it feeds to the Taiwan Fact Checking Center. Um, so once something that becomes public knowledge that's not in the secret encrypted channel, it becomes the purview of the Taiwan Fact Checking <coughs> Center. The TFCC, um, which is very uh, active nowadays, they basically look at all the trending uh, disinformation campaigns and do a real investigative reporting style report on whether this is true or not. And they hold themselves to a really high standard <coughs> sorry, by disclosing exactly how their investigative reporting, their sources, citations, everything, like true journalism work. And because of this, they are part of the international fact-checking network, the IFCN at Pointer Institute. And uh, because of their membership, anything that is clarified as wrong here is actually taken into account by popular social media algorithms such as Google and Facebook. Things that are clarified as wrong by the IFCN member on average, I'm not saying just in Taiwan, on average, 
Facebook says it reduces the exposure of these messages uh, to the uh, one fifth of previously, and they're still working on that. And so having this is very important because this is totally independent. It is not pro PPP or KMT or MPP. These are all very well respected journalists doing journalistic work. But once they find that these are actually disinformation, it can massively reduce the virality of that information on social media. So this is our last line of defense in the uh, collaboration with civil society. So just to recap, media literacy first, and then timely response, and then through COFAC and other bots, uh, review those virus before they get really viral. That is how big things are made anyway. And so once these are reviewed, the Taiwan Fact Check Center steps into the process. But the most important thing is that everything here is transparent and accountable, so everybody can join. And even the government itself can be held accountable. If we make any mistake, we also correct and clarify within four hours. And it's also posted on COFAX and other civil society partnerships. I hope that answers at least part of your question. Yes. It's exciting to know there are so many websites uh, to uh, uh, participate in the democratic of uh, Taiwan. <coughs> Who is the one support and uh, managing all this, uh, for example, the TFCC? <coughs> Uh, the funding, of course, of PFCC is entirely independent. Uh, they are not taking, neither is COFACT taking government money, for the record. Uh, because if uh, they take government money, if the majority of their money is from the uh, public sector, then it creates a conflict of interest, and they will not be able to hold ourselves <laughs> to account. But there are many people in the civil society actually supporting their work. And this is actually a special thing in, in Taiwan that we don't find in many other places, um, at least in East Asia. Because as I mentioned, our uh, civil society's development um, starts even before our first presidential election. Right? Our first presidential election is 1996. But the lifting of martial law is almost 10 years before that. So there's 10 years of time before the legitimacy of democratic institution is established. The NGOs. Many of them occupy the parliament of the 20 NGOs, established their own credibility that has a higher legitimacy even compared to administration. Some of them continue to this day. And so th there's many people who are you know, working on organizations. It could be a co-op uh, like the Taiwan Homemakers Union. Uh, or it could be a foundation like here for us. It could be a company like Li Ren working on environmental justice and things like that that has a very high legitimacy and a good business model that's been running for 30 years and not to mention Ciji and friends, right? Uh, and so they are all independently um, having a good sustainable business model. And so when new like Taiwan Fact Checking Center starts, it leverages these old NGOs like Media Watch and Human Rights and, and things like that. And so both the credibility and the human force and the volunteer base and things like that is just like that. And then after not only three months, I think just three months, yeah, uh, they join the international fact checking network. Usually it takes years to prove the credentials. But because the people who bootstrap this all have like decades of uh, public credibility, it gets recognized internationally very quickly. And I think this is unique in Taiwan that people in the social sector has organized even before the democratic institution and even now has higher legitimacy in many areas of sustainable development compared to the public sector. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought there was, uh, uh, so sorry. Sure. So just um, I'm curious, um, you, you mentioned Estonia as, as another yes. similar model to Taiwan where they yes. have gone completely digital. But do you do you receive, you know, personally or government through the government, any any calls on studying your digital governance model mm -hmm. and and any appetite for applying something in, in other parts, you yes. know, Eastern, Western societies, Northern, Southern? What you, I, I, it, I I'm just so in awe of everything mm -hmm. that that I've heard and learned. Um, but the, just the very governance model is yes. their appetite, and are you know are they are yeah. people calling you for tutorials? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, so as we speak now, actually, a delegate uh, is in uh, South Korea 
uh, for the Open Government Partnership uh, Summit in, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and people from civil society and our National Development Council, our gender equality department and so on, are all in South Korea sharing our digital governance approaches as we speak. Uh, and as we speak, there's a delegation from my office, three people, designers, coders in Madrid, working with Madrid City, um, applying this kind of collective intelligence, but on public construction projects. So we can all put on VR or mixed reality and see a new airport from the feeling of the future airports, which is one of the things that we cannot actually do now because not all people can view a movie or a PowerPoint and visualize a building in their head. It requires an architect's training, right? But if we can put people into hypothetical um, architect's visions, like live in it and do deliberation within it, it's called Holopolis. And the Spain people really likes it, and so we're working with them. And uh, the e-petition system, actually, we took the commentary system from Better Reykjavik uh, in Iceland. And so at the moment, again, one of my colleagues is working with the Icelandic pirates, uh, uh, pirate party, <laughs> to, uh, to, to work on this information and, and port this model that we just uh, thought uh, to WhatsApp and other uh, venues uh, that make sure that Icelandic elections are not tampered with uh, by this information and things like that. So yeah, we do participate actively in both the Digital Nations uh, Working Group and the uh, Open Government Partnership uh, events. Uh, yes. Uh, with all due respect, Minister, yes. uh, looking forward to digital technology and the future AI, yes. do you keep an eye constantly on the Gini factor? Because rich people yes. are getting Definitely. much richer yes. and poor people are getting poorer. Yes. Definitely. So, um, yes, and this is a very good time to introduce our AI um, network of development. So, this, this is an AI project, right? but it doesn't take anyone's job away, okay? This is basically a playground, a sandbox, for people to feel like how, I don't know, wolves and early hominid co-domesticated into dogs and human beings by learning to follow each other's eyes and nose and nonverbal uh, gestures and things like that. What, what I'm saying is that it needs to solve a real social problem and it needs to, the norm needs to be set by everybody not just people in Silicon Valley or MIT. Uh, and then these things must be open in the sense that local people must be able to tinker it. You, this is actually the idea of personal computing. Uh, back in 1980, when Taiwan become, you know, personal computer, where personal computer is known for, right? Late um, 80s. Um, the, the previous doctrine was a, of a mainframe computer, a huge computer that is maybe one-tenth powerful as this iPad. But anyway, and, and people connect to it as terminals, and you don't have any control of the logic that's running on the mainframe. But the promise of personal computer, and later on uh, mobile computing, is that you can install the apps that fits your lifestyle, and they kind of co-evolve with you. It must be the same with AI, that people need to be able to interrogate, to communicate, to change like this flashing red light when it's feeling uneasy, to maybe, uh, I don't know, a, a emoji or a dog face or whatever, as they feel like. This is what personal computing means, and which is why we make sure first problem is human rights and AI integrated to all levels of education so that all children can feel that AI is something that they have agency over, <laughs> not something that they subscribe to and have agency over them. And this is the utmost importance in Taiwan's AI development philosophy. And so when anyone applies for a sandbox <coughs> experiment, which is uh, um, application to break laws and regulations for a year to prove that it's good for the society, uh, this is a new innovation system we introduced just this year. Anything that you have an AI or for banking, AI for transportation, AI for, I don't know, parking lot allocation, you name it, uh, you can go to Sandbox or GTW and say, you know, there is a social problem or environmental problem here or economic, you need to regional revitalization. I think that this regulation or law is blocking the society from progressing. I would like a year to prove to the people who are on the ground the vulnerable people, the people who are the most impacted with technology, that this is a good idea. And if after a year that people think it's a good idea, it becomes law, it becomes regulation, but only if people who are in, uh, uh, impacted knows and agrees that it's a good idea. 
And so if it's about platform economy, like sharing your parking lot space, it goes to the National Development Council. If it's AI banking, it goes to FinTech. Uh, and if it's uh, anchored vehicles, which will pass maybe early January next year, um, it goes to the Ministry of Economy. And this is, again, very different. In other countries, it would go to the Ministry of Transportation, which would have very different rules for ships and boats, uh, you know, that kind of transportation and drones that flies and cars. But for the Ministry of Economy, they are all the same. And so you have, can have lots of hybrid that you know, flies while it drives and um, are in, 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 in the fields, uh, like goes to the land after sailing for a while. And then it all needs to correspond to a local need. Like in the remote islands, they don't have sufficient boat to transport them. Or in the rural or indigenous areas, the, the MRT doesn't quite go there. So they need uh, a bus that serves as the last mile of MRT or things like that. And they can all experiment for a year, including the business model. If it's a good idea, it becomes law or regulation. If it's not a good idea, the entire society learns something. The data is shared for the next innovator to try a different angle, so it builds upon each other. And finally, if the MPs need time to deliberate on the law level, because we're a continental law system, we need a real law change if it has to go back to the parliament, you can continue to operate to serve the people's societal needs for up to four years, essentially a monopoly. But afterwards, uh, of course, the competitor will enter the market. And so we basically tour around Taiwan. I personally, every Tuesday, tour around Taiwan. So Wednesday, I'm in Taipei in the uh, Social Innovation Lab. But every other Tuesday, I mean, this is Hualien. And people who are even more remote, like Taidong or so on, can teleconference in. But anytime I go there and talk to the local people who are the most impacted by technologies, they will tell me the real social needs and environmental needs. And at the same time, 12 ministries related to social innovation gather in the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei and see through my eyes. I'm like an investigative reporter. They see what I see in the place that I stay for a couple of days or uh, meet with the local um, indigenous assembly or things like that. And all the ministries related to, to social innovations are there. So previously, the people here will say, you know, we need our local co-op to be recognized in, in some procurement rules. Or they will say that we have a local association <coughs> that would really like to be a social enterprise by uh, using, uh, you know, uh, impact investment uh, programs and things like that. But usually, in the previous battle days, they would talk to one ministry, and that ministry would say, oh, we're just the Ministry of Interior, where we re re register, we'll have to talk to with the economic minister, we will have to talk with the Ministry of Health and Welfare, and so on, and it would take like five months before anything even goes back to that innovator. But now, because all the ministries are there, and so it's impossible for them to go that into that bureaucratic flow, they have to actually, in a very relaxed mood with a resident chef, remember, uh, <laughs> to, to brainstorm, uh, to solve a local need uh, within two weeks. So every uh, local issue that's brought up need to be resolved on the record after two weeks, after each meeting, and then I tour to another place, carry on the conversation. And if they cannot be reached uh, in two weeks, sometimes it's resolved by another regional innovation meeting to resolve issues on the previous region. But if that doesn't happen in two weeks, we list it as an open challenge for people to, to work on. And if you want to apply for a sandbox experiment or something, you can cite that as a rationale and say, just by you know, surfacing this problem and having on the record radical transparency, record of the ministry saying, we really don't know how to solve this problem, you get an automatic pass into the sandbox system where you can take a try as a social entrepreneur to solve the problem, and we will adjust the regulation and interpretations for you. So this is co-creation, not just for the people, but with the people. That is the philosophy. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm in this in the, for the long haul, right? So uh, for the long, long run, I joined uh, as an understudy minister, as an advisor to the public service around the end of 2014. And the people who invited me, uh, Minister Jacqueline Tsai, uh, Deputy Premier Simon Zhang, uh, these people are 
Jacqueline was from IBM Asia, uh, director of law, IBM Asia. Um, Simon John was director of engineering, Google, uh, and I was at the time, of course, um, you know, independent contractor and advisor, Apple. And so we, we share very similar ethos, right? We, we share this idea of rapid innovation and listening to users and working with people as people, right? Uh, and so we are all nonpartisan. Uh, I don't have any party affiliation. I don't even care about political parties. And, and so people know that I'm here for the public service, who are neutral, and who are here also for the long run, right? And so when the transition happened after the election, uh, Simon Zhang transitioned to, I think, Dr. Lin Chen, right? Uh, and the two premiers, both independent, they did something that's never happened in Taiwanese political history. Uh, Simon Zhang asked all the ministries to publish a checkpoint document of including open governments, where things are going, including data and evidence and everything, to the public internet. And for the new premier and the new cabinet to download from the public internet to complete the transition. He even asked for the transition to be live streamed. But uh, people said, you know, there's too many meetings. Maybe we just published a summary, which they did. Uh, in any case, that benefits me, because I joined the new cabinet only five, like five months after they formed. Right? I joined in October. The new cabinet was in May. But I was able to hit the road running, so to speak, because the transition was in public. And I can study the transition documents, as can any other person on Earth. And so this basically says anything that is institutionalized as open government in Taiwan, there's no going back because it is the new norm. People start to feel that they're entitled to get this from the government. So every cabinet must only move more forward because the when, when we talk about the, for example, the, the joint platform and the um, you know e-participatory uh, regulation and things like that, the KMT people loves to say that this was passed under President Ma ying right? <laughs> because that, that's what they did. Uh, around 2015. And President Tsai Ing-wen, of course, has open government as her main campaign. And also, the uh, participation offices, which was signed into effect by Mayor, um, sorry, Premier Lai ching uh, it was because when he ran for mayor for the Tainan city for the second term, open government was his platform. Uh, and for a while, um, he has a very interesting relationship with city council because he refused to go to the city council because the head councilor was involved in some, I don't know, criminal investigation or something like that. So instead, he bypassed the city council and went precinct to precinct, township to township, and talked directly to people and do the regional innovation thing. And with the um, you know, uh, research and development um, uh, officer, um, Dr. Chameling, uh, with him and taking into account of the requirements of all the different precincts, like being a direct democratic mayor instead of going to the city council and answer to the representative democracy. Of course, that got resolved, and later on he entered the city council. But then he had first hand experience, and after he became the premier, not only he signed this uh, PO regulation, but he personally went on a tour to all the different cities and counties in Taiwan, exactly as the same as he did in Tainan City, and also helped by the head of National Development Council, the same Dr. Chameli in Taiwan, Tainan. <laughs> and, so, and so this is great because he went on an economic innovation tour, and I go on a social innovation tour, but both with the idea of regional revitalization, which is our new national direction starting next year. So what I'm saying is that open government on a national and municipal level, it is a culture that cannot be turned back now. But now in the township precinct level, that is still just now being uh, devolved into those um, government and jurisdictions. And Tainan City, for example, just adopted the participation office and network. And many other cities are committed to do that after the midterm election. And so, yeah, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I'm nonpartisan. Whichever party that runs the cabinet, I'm working with the cabinet, not for the cabinet anyway. So I'm here for the long So yeah, shall we go back to Slido for another <laughs> 10, <laughs> 10 minutes? And I'll, I'll answer it quickly without reading out loud. Yeah. So um, because the anonymous questions are often the most interesting. Uh, right? <clears throat> so yeah. Oh yeah, the examination yuan. Uh, the examination yuan is an interesting partnership uh, in, in, in our open government work. We have uh, a five-branch government, right? Uh, and the examination yuan and the corrective yuan are 
um, unique inventions by Dr. Sanyasen, and uh, we are um, in partnership with those two very unique branches. Uh, the, <laughs> the corrective yuan, uh, which has no counterpart, I don't even try to translate that, uh, <laughs> is the one that audits uh, at the administration uh, and uh, make sure that uh, we keep ourselves honest. And so we enroll them into the open government platform by providing them this free platform that they can ask people for fear, uncertainty, and doubt on each and every innovation by the public sector. So before, they were seen as people who blocked the progress. But now, they're seen as people who further the process by looking at each new thing and ask the people, what are your fears, uncertainty, and doubts? And we will professionally collect all your doubts into like nine points of new auditing uh, questions and ask the minister in charge of social entrepreneurship, that's me. And then <laughs> I will answer with the nine point by point uh, ways, which they then establish the new auditing rules. And then so the innovation policy sector can continue and they can answer to the you know um, corrective UN bosses saying, you know, we have answered uh, all the people's doubts. So obviously we have done our job. So instead of being the enemy of both the citizens and the administration, they're now friends of the both citizens administration just by shifting to open governments and we're very envious of them because when we post a new question for people to contribute ideas a public consultation um, if it's obscure like domestic uh, local urban renovation maybe 40 people can and we consider that a like success but for the same small scale thing when the corrective UN ask who has fear uncertainty, and doubt as you can see hundreds of people came Obviously, it's easier to um, put out your doubts <coughs> rather than your suggestions. So that's the corrective UN. Uh, the examination UN, similarly, we have petition systems that works for them also. For example, there is a popular e-petition, obviously by public servants. There are petitions for the new uh, leave of absence rule. Uh, previously, when we take a leave, it has to be at least half a day long. But nowadays, because people are really want to care for the elderly, or uh, actually there's a teleworking initiative going on also, um, they petitioned collectively. And the examination Yuan was very active in actually contributing to the open government process. Actually, they just uh, ratified this e-petition by actively participating in the process that accurately reflects the collective will of the public service. And so they can be seen as the enlightened one. And then the administration, uh, because it's still you know, waiting for a few days to publish, the, the pressure is from the examination to the administration to ratify this new rule that is being petitioned by 5,000 public servants. And so again, examination Yuan is now seen as a friend to the public service rather than you know, someone who holds back the public service. And all this is because, as I said, the credit is shared, the credit is spread in a way that is due, and the risk is absorbed by participation. Nobody you know, needs a yi uh, zhu, a, a cause or a guan qian he, a, a signature by the upper echelon of uh, public service because they can cite the political will and the consensus and say, this is what people really want. And the examination UN and the corrective UN are totally on board with this philosophy as well. Um, do you worry that I would become a tool of neoliberal capitalism? Um, I am a vassal of conservative anarchism, which is very different from neoliberal capitalism. Um, anarchism uh, means very simply that I take no orders and I give no orders. I have not given a, a single order as a digital minister. All, everybody in my office volunteer to work with me. I had an agreement with the Secretary General that I can poach at most one person from each ministry who volunteer to work with me. And so literally, I can have 34 staff because there's exactly 34 ministries. At the moment, I have 22. And so for example, this is our foreign affair ministry <laughs> delegate uh, to, to our uh, office. And so this creates a culture of voluntary association of people just brainstorming any idea, anything that they want to do, bring a comic book or whatever, right? <laughs> bring a t-shirt uh, and, and people just go ahead and do it. And it makes sure that, it, because every ministry is a different social or environmental or economic value, right? So if something that is a consensus of these people it is of no harm to any ministry. And the innovation that we do can be done in a way without resorting to horizontal power. And so this is, uh, sorry, to vertical power, which is entirely horizontal power, new power, as, as we call it. There's a book about it. And so anarchism is by default 
a way for people to associate that achieve what we call Pareto improvement. That is to say improvement that leaves nobody behind. And through a conservative lens, meaning that I don't go to the Department of Defense and say, tomorrow you're going to adopt radical transparency. I'm not doing that, right? People only bring to me cases that I feel that they are wicked problems, meaning that they're structural problems that has hit the Nash equilibrium, meaning that nobody can act alone to solve the problem. Everybody needs to coordinate, form a consensus, and move together to solve the problem. So if the problem is of this shape, it's brought to my office for deliberation and open government. But if they think that they can solve it just fine with their old vertical power model, they don't even bother me. I don't even know about these things. And so this is a way that complements but doesn't reinforce neoliberal capitalism or any form of vertical power. Sorry. So, I mean, you've talked a lot about achieving consensus. Yes. And consensus, by definition, is a consensus of the majority. No. 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 So how do you A vote is a vote by majority. Yeah. A consensus is something that's acceptable, that everybody can live with. So, well, can you talk more about yes. So how do you address, you know, say, a small vocal minority, or, you know, if there's some issue that, you know, um, has a, that's a, a sort of a thorn in the side of, you know, a, a majority that agrees. No, we, 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 don't, we don't work on majority rule. Um, the, 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 there's a document called the DAO of IETF, of Internet Engineering Task Force. It says, uh, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. So meaning that any, anyone who has even anything, as you said, in the minority, so to speak, and we, we don't say that, we say plurality, but anyway. so. We don't even look at those numbers. Those numbers don't even mean anything. As you can see, these numbers of people, they have no correspondence to the area of diversity of their opinions. If you mobilize 5,000 people and vote exactly the same way, you will add number here, but area will not increase because this is diversity of opinion. This is not by majority rule. And we say, if we are to enter the agenda, you need to convince everybody in every group. It's called a super majority. So that especially you need to convince people who are diametrically opposed to you. And only then it becomes a binding agenda for the rough consensus <coughs> process. So we explicitly said that any sentiment that only has local consensus uh, is, we read that aloud, but it's not entering the agenda. We respect people's differences, but only the commonalities enter the agenda. Yeah, and so um, there's many technical ways of achieving that. There's uh, the idea of overlapping consensus. There's the idea of if you abstract to the common value high enough, people can always reach a common understanding. There's the idea of sustainability. I can't go into details, but that is our philosophy going forward. Yeah. Yes. So we're almost at time, like two minutes. So so let me let me go back to the last. Okay, sure. Um, actually, we did uh, the disinformation one. So okay, um, some major social consensus challenges facing Taiwan. I, I would say that uh, there are many people in Taiwan at the moment still believe uh, in authoritarian power structures. There are people who still think that an efficient authoritarian rule is sometimes better than a somewhat more deliberate, one month long decision making process that involves rough consensus. To me, one month or two months is a good um, time period to have an iteration. But there are still some people who believe that you really need to fast track things and you know just by a majority rule or just by some political will uh, to not go through a proper conversation for, for two months. And for me, I think this is a culture of the people who are educated before the martial law gets lifted and the people who are, uh, get educated after 
especially the educational reform of the 90s. And so I think the time is on our side. And also <laughs> that we, we do all we can through lifelong education efforts to make sure that people respect the plurality. And so uh, this, uh, uh, to me, is the difference between IT and digital. IT, which Taiwan is known for even before lifting of the martial law, is more like hardware, precision, low cost, you know, supply chain management and so on, which Taiwan is still very strong at. But we cannot use that culture for the consensus forming democratic culture. It calls for a digital culture. So I'm going to read you a poem as a conclusion, which is my job description when they asked me for a job description two years ago that highlights the difference between the IT way of thinking about politics and the digital way of thinking about human beings. And it goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always keep in mind, always remember that the plurality is here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Tong. I, I was so impressed and inspired and amazed by the presentation. I learned so much from it. And I was so, uh, also very impressed by the fact that the digital infrastructure in Taiwan and so sort of tied together with civil society in the spirit of transparency mm -hmm. and work participation. So I'm very, very impressed. Perhaps that is, in fact, you know, something we really could be called the Taiwan way. And the mm -hmm. Taiwan way, right? And mm -hmm. I can see a t-shirt saying, Taiwan can help. Yes. And please help us. You know, I, I can see um, many people here would need help, many politicians mm -hmm. in our political systems, and mm -hmm. many people in the room, whether you are social innovators, entrepreneurs, or mm -hmm. academics. I, I already want to steal many ideas from this. Uh, I think the Asian Institute probably could use some of this idea as well. Um, and so I'm so glad that I steal you from the workshop that mm -hmm. you were supposed to participate. So thank you again, and thank you. Thank you for the great question.